Hello and welcome to Louise Singleton Creations. Today I'm going to be showing you how to make this plaster box frame to create a textured base for your resin ocean pores and also to form a ready-made frame so you can have a break from preparing and masking all those canvases. And then I'll show you how I transformed my plaster base into the finished ocean scene. Right, so your first job is going to be to cut a template out of some cardboard. It needs to be the size that you want your overall frame to be, but then you need to also cut out the aperture from the middle, and you will be using both pieces. Now you need to roll out two pieces of your modelling clay to the size of the inner part of your template. One can be a little bit smaller, but one of them does need to be as big as that inner part of your template. I've made two guides for my rolling pin by just taping together four jumbo lolly sticks, which is about six millimetres. Now I'm cutting a wavy line with my craft knife. This will be form the edge of my upper wave. Here I'm just smoothing down the edge with my finger as you can see and the reason for that is to make a more gradual decline in the thickness of the layer where you see the water's edge so it's not so abrupt. Now I'm making the impression of the ripples in the waves using a selection of ball stylus tools. I'm using a small one first and then larger and larger just so that the ripples in the water are kind of um, more pointed towards the top. Here what I'm doing is poking the stylus tool into the clay to make indentations which will form the sea foam because this ripple here will be the edge of the water.
I'm just using some stones which I collected from the garden to imprint into the clay to form the stones on the beach. I'm doing it kind of like so it frames the picture so there's, there's more at the corners and it gradually gets less towards the middle. I just like the way it frames the picture to arrange the imprints like that. Oh, and now I'm using a toothbrush just to get a gentle sand texture. This larger second piece is actually going to form the top layer, uh, the top wave, which you will see uppermost on the finished piece. It's all kind of, you've got to get your head around it, it's kind of all back to front and it, it does mess with your head a little bit, but you'll see, you'll see what happens. <laughs> so yeah, this bit, although it looks like it's going to be the bottom bit when the two pieces are put together is actually going to be the top part so I'm just doing the bit right at the top which is going to be the top wave. Now I'm trimming the edges using the template, I'm doing it much more precisely this time because it needs to be the finished size now. I prefer to cut the two pieces separately just because it means I can put, get the template flat down onto the clay. If I put them together first it's a little trickier to cut them. Now I'm just carefully putting the top piece onto the bottom piece. As you can see, it didn't quite match up, so I did need to trim that edge just a little bit. I'm just using the stylus tool again where the two pieces meet just to make sure that they're properly blended in together and you can't see that there was ever a join there. Now for the next step, this is where it starts to get interesting. So I've stuck down some sticky backed vinyl onto a chopping board. It didn't actually stick very well so I used some tape as well to stick down the, the vinyl because that that particular vinyl, it just gives such a lovely smooth finish to the frame that I really wanted to use it. I went into my shed and I found four pieces of wood big enough to form the barrier for the plaster of Paris. And what I've done is I've used aluminium tape on the wood to give it a nice smooth finish also it stops any air that's in the wood coming out and causing bubbles in the plaster so it forms a nice seal and it makes the wood come off the plaster in the end much better and I'm clamping it into position using that template as a guide to make sure I've got it completely square that's why the template is so important it's really handy take your time on this part I did actually 
carry on faffing around with it after I'd stopped recording because I wanted to make sure my clamps were completely clamping that wood down so that the plaster didn't leak underneath. I'm just using a light coloured pencil just to draw the inner um, rectangle <laughs> so that I know where to put my clay. Because of the length of those clamps, you're going to need to put something underneath this to keep it level and to hold it elevated from the table. Um, I've used cups here, but I did find that it everything was just too heavy for them. So I replaced the cups for some um, aerosol cans, four aerosol cans, and it was much stronger in the end. Here I'm using some of my leftover clay just to block any little gaps in the corners because if the plaster is going to escape from anywhere it's going to be the corners so I'm just pressing in some clay in all four corners. In order to be able to hang your finished picture you're going to need a hook at the back so what I've made here is well, I've rolled out some clay and I've cut out two circles with a cookie cutter and I've put some just ordinary um, garden wire, it's quite strong wire, between sandwiched between the two circles and I've kind of bent the ends so that it really locks into the plaster much better. For this project I'm using stone cast plaster which is a much much stronger form of plaster of Paris. You can use regular plaster of Paris but I do prefer this, it's much stronger and I've mixed it according to the instructions on the packet which is two parts uh, plaster to one part water and you need to add the plaster to the water. I'm pouring the plaster in two layers so this first bit doesn't only just covers that top that highest bit but that's fine I'm going to be putting another layer on it's just so that I could insert that hook uh, um, the hook with the clay on uh, onto the first layer and then do the second layer once the plaster's in you need to give the board a good shake well a gentle shake just to get any bubbles that are in that frame released because you don't want bubbles in your frame. Right, so the first layer is set. As I said before, I'm just putting that hook into position and I didn't quite get it central, but it's okay. <laughs> I'm putting it into position and then I'm pouring the rest of the plaster over the top. The way I've designed this to work is so that the hook is in a recess and then it hangs flush against the wall. Right, it's time for the big reveal. I'm taking off those wooden pieces and it pops off really nicely with that foil on. And I'm going to use a lollipop stick just to remove the clay from the recess. It is important when you're removing the clay from these pieces that you use something that's not going to scratch the plaster. So that's why I'm using wood. And now we have our inbuilt hanging wire. Don't worry about those little bits that are showing just on the edges where it's just leaked under the wood a little bit. It's fine, it comes off so easily, it just snaps off with an emery board. In fact, you can see here that I'm just knocking them off with my fingers, those little bits where it leaked. I chose a bad place to uh, start taking the clay out because I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't quite get it started. But it does all just peel off lovely. Once you get a place to get a purchase on it and start to pull, it, it does come out easily. It's just 
I chose to do it right where all those stones are and I couldn't quite get a grip on the plaster. But yeah, it, it does actually come out a lot easier than it looks. And here we go, I finally got a grip on it and it's pulled out cleanly and there we have it. And what I did next, while it was all soft, I just ran it underneath some water gently and with a really soft toothbrush I just rinsed away any last little bits of clay that were remaining. I'm just using a craft knife here just to finish off those inner edges and just smooth them down. When it's only just been demoulded it's still fairly soft so at this stage it's really easy to just get rid of any bits that need smoothing out. You need to put the plaster in a warm place and leave it at least a day before you start painting it. The longer you can leave it, the better, especially if you're using regular plaster of Paris, leave it about a week. But with the stone cast plaster, I've found it does dry out much quicker, but still leave it as long as you possibly can if you're patient enough. Before I started painting, I did actually put a coat of polyurethane varnish on this whole um, recess area and gave it half an hour to dry. And it just helps to seal the plaster before you start applying paint. And here I'm just using some pearlescent paint uh, all over the water area and the sea foam area. I'm using mostly metallic paints for this um, water area just because it gives it a much more shimmery effect. When I'd finished painting the stones, I just got a household wipe 
one of those one wet ones in a packet. I just got one of those and just gently rubbed the tops of all the stones and it just takes away the top layer of paint and gives you that natural highlight and it works really well. I really like to have some green tones mixed in with the blue and what I like to do is just use some gold on top of the teal and that way you form a natural green with the teal and the gold and it blends in so much nicer than if I'd brought in a different green from just a bottle of green paint. I just think it's a really subtle effect and I really do like the shade of green that it achieved. I'm adding some darker blue now just to add some depth and contrast but also I like to have it in the top corners. Whenever I do a picture I tend to try and make all the four corners the darkest areas in the picture is just one of the things I like to do and so I've made sure I've got it in the two top corners but I'm also using it at the edges of the ripples just, just to make the water ripples stand out a little bit. I'm just adding some earth tones towards the bottom of the water where it starts to get close to the sand just because I, in, in reality you don't really get blue water meeting the sand it's always clearer towards the edge so that's why I've made it look less blue and more sandy. I'm just finishing off by going over some of those bits of sea foam that I've got covered up by the other paints just with the white again just to make them pop a little bit more. Here I'm adding another layer of the polyurethane varnish. It's not essential, but I do like to do it. I would say it is essential to do it on the sand because that's not going to be covered in resin and you want to protect the paint really. So put it definitely on the sand area, but it's up to you whether you use it on the water. I just like to completely seal it before I put the resin on. I'm just adding some extra fine white glitter to the wet um, varnish just where the sand is just to make the sand have that natural kind of glistening glittery effect but the trouble is I did zoom in so that you could see it but you can't see it in the video but in real life it really, it really enhances the sand and makes it look lovely. Right then so I've 
thoroughly mixed my resin, it's total cast resin, and I've mixed it in a silicon bowl. And I really love using that bowl because once the resin's set, you can just throw to peel it out, throw it away, and you're not wasting plastic cups. I'm using clear resin for this uh, because I've already painted all the colour on. That's how I wanted to do it. You could miss out the bit where, I, where you paint the colour on and just use coloured resin. That's up to you, but this was my preference. Here I'm just getting rid of the bubbles in the resin with my heat gun. And making and by blowing it around a bit, you make sure you haven't left any gaps anywhere. So it it's got a double purpose. Here I'm adding a little bit of white pigment paste to my less leftover resin just to do a little bit of an extra seafoam detail in the resin. I do have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with this process. Sometimes when I do it I get really good lacing effects and sometimes I don't. Maybe I need to be a bit more precise measuring out my pigment. There's something that I've sometimes do wrong and I need to work out what it is so yeah <laughs> um, it didn't work out exactly as I wanted it to today. I'm sure if you've tried this before you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm just blowing it around a little bit with my heat gun and it's at this stage where the lacing will happen or not happen as the case may be. I always think it's good to have a backup plan if something doesn't work and so here some might call it cheating but whatever you want to call it it works quite nicely. I've got some resi blast which I've dipped a cocktail stick into the resi blast and I'm just um, putting the cocktail stick into the resin in all the places where I wanted the colour to disperse and form that cell. At this point, this is when I needed somebody in the room by my side saying, now leave it, don't do anything else, don't touch it, don't move it. Unfortunately, there was nobody there to do that. I've got not knowing when to stop. And I'm looking back at it now while I'm narrating, I like it there. And I kind of got carried away with it and didn't leave it alone. And I lost most of that. <sighs> Will I ever learn? Probably not. Anyway, it looked okay in the end. I was still pleased with the final result. I just wish I could learn to leave things alone. One of my favourite things about using these box frames for my resin pictures, apart from the fact that I don't have to tape any sides of canvases and things, no masking involved, the very best thing is when you finish, you can just pop something flat on top of the resin, on top of the frame, <laughs> sorry, I leave a little bit of a gap so it can breathe but then no fluff or anything gets in there and it's easy, just pop it on top. So here's the finished result, it's so satisfying to be able to just pour your resin and not worry about the edges and the ready-made frame is such a bonus. Coming up with this method took me many hours of trial and error, not to mention the time it took to create the video. So I would greatly appreciate it if you acknowledge where you got the idea if you display your own creations on social media. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you haven't already subscribed, please do. And if you did enjoy it, please give me a thumbs up.